Stay tuned, because when we come back, we'll take a trip down memory lane. Welcome to another episode of Monster Review. Recently, I found myself watching some videos of people reviewing old Tekken toys that they still might have, such as NES, Super NES, Game Boy, Data Blasters, and more. I recently found a stash of my old stuff in my parents' attic and decided, hey, I should do one of those videos I like watching so much. So with no more delays, let's begin. This Game Gear looking toy is actually nothing like the Game Gear. It's probably one of the most boring toys I've ever owned. It's called the QuizWiz and it's by Tiger Electronics. QuizWiz has been around since 1979 and was first produced by Coleco. If you were a kid back then, the name might sound familiar because it's the same company behind the short-lived ColecoVision home video game console. Later in the early 90s, Tiger Electronic released an updated version of the popular toy which is what I have in my hands right now. There isn't a whole lot of info on this toy, but if I was to make an educated guess, I'd say by the mid 90s the quiz was died out, leaving the model I have in my hand, the last model produced by Tiger Electronics. The device is simple by today's standards, but advanced for its time, especially in 1979. If you look at the commercial for the 1979 model, they actually called it the quiz Wiz computer. The device, like a handheld game console, takes a cartridge. This is how the QuizWiz knows the answer to the questions in the provided book. You buy a new cartridge and it comes with its own quiz book. Look for the questions you want to answer, punch in the question number, punch in the answer letter, and the QuizWiz will let you know if you're right or wrong. The cartridge and book I have is the pack-in book one in general knowledge, but you can get a cartridge in anything from sports, TV, movies, and geography. The device runs off of three AA batteries and closes up so you can take it wherever you go. This unit has long been discontinued so the only way to buy one would be to purchase a used unit. So what's the story behind mines? Well, my grandma bought it for me as a present in 1998. It's possible these things were still on sale at the time or annoying my grandma she probably stocked up on clearance toys well before 1998 but just happened to gift it to me on that year. I'm not entirely sure, I was only 9 at the time. I was never into quiz games, so I never played with the quiz whiz. Instead, I put it away which explains why I still have it in my possession. The unit still works as you saw earlier and no, I'm still not into quiz games, so after this video, it's going back in storage where my son will probably make a video on it 20 years from now. This game device was all the rage in the late 90s. Everyone had one, making Radica best known for the Bass Fishing Line games. There were a couple of knockoffs, but the brand did so well for themselves that people knew to look for Radica on the package. This game was just so much fun. It was a must have on every kid's wish list, including mine. Even adults loved this game. At first, I thought it was the stupidest game ever until I played with one for the first time. From then on, I made it my goal to get one. If you were a kid that spent a lot of time traveling, this was the one game to make sure you packed along with your Game Boy. Radica was bought out by Mattel on October 3rd, 2006, but they still produce handheld games under the Radica name. The game is very simple to play. You have the option to change your lore, lake, boat location, and look at your biggest catch. Once you find a nice spot to fish, you cast your line and slowly reel it back in keeping the line tension centered and keeping the lure in front of fishes using your radar. You wait for a bite, then start pulling your catch in. When you get a bite, your device starts to vibrate, which I believe helped make the game so successful. It provided more realism to the game. You can still buy this unit today under Mattel, but expect to pay anywhere between $50 to $80. You might also find a brand new 1998 original produced by Radica on sites like Amazon and eBay for around the same price. But watch out, one buyer alleged to receive batteries from the 90s included in his unit. The one I have in my hand is manufactured in 1998. So what's the story behind mines? My grandma bought it for me over the summer of 1998. I had stayed with her for a week and as a reward for helping out around the house, she bought it for me. By 1998, the fishing game craze had eased up, but I was still pretty excited to get one. I remember she couldn't understand why I wanted this game instead of Yahtzee's, which she wanted to buy so me and my brothers can play together. She tried so hard to change my mind, but come on, it's Radica Bass Fishing. I played this game regularly. 
But as I got older, I was introduced to the real thing resulting in me handing down this game to my nephew. When my nephew grew up, my mom packed all his toys in the attic including this bass fishing game, which is where I recently found it. This drill was produced somewhere between 1992 and 1997. It was part of a metal construction toy kit similar to Meccano called Steeltech. The kit came with a bunch of metal and plastic brackets that could be linked together via a metal screw to create things. The kit usually just came with an Allen key, but the deluxe kit would come with a drill or you could purchase the drill separately. The drill takes two double A's and has a housing compartment for the drill bits. The drill is also convertible, allowing you to change it from a drill to a power screwdriver. It has forward, reverse, and the drill plus construction kit has been discontinued since 1997 Although there are rumors it might make a comeback under 4Kids Incorporated. So what's the story behind Mines? Well, my dad bought me a Steel Tech construction kit in the mid 90s. It's the oldest toy I still currently have. In fact, it's so old I can't pinpoint when I was given it. The construction kit has been since long gone, but for some odd reason I managed to hold on to the drill. My dad is a mechanical engineer and wanted to see if I had any curiosity in building or fixing. I was young at the time so I lost all the pieces before we could build something together. But I did indeed develop a skill set in engineering which I recently did for a living. I think if he had waited a couple more years I would have been much more interested in the steel tech kit. But I did used to play with the drill and pretend to fix things around the house. But nowadays this drill can't cut it so I had to upgrade to something more usable. But I do my own home renovations and repair and who is to say it didn't start with my first power drill screwdriver. Now let's see which drill is better. <laughs> Just kidding. This RX-8 was simply a beauty. This RC car is supposed to be a tuner RX-8 that allowed you to change out the rims, customize the stickers, even change out the RX-8 shell for a Nissan 350Z. This RC was manufactured and sold in 2003 exclusively at Walmart for about 50 bucks. It was produced by Easy Tech, which is owned by Scientific Toys Incorporated, which is still making RC cars today. This car came with a pistol grip type controller with proportionate steering control. It wasn't precise, but pretty darn close. It came with a set of chrome rim tires, gold rim tires as shown, remote control, 9.6 volts battery pack, charger, stickers, plastic mini safety cones, plastic wrench to change tires, and came programmed to either band 1, 2, 3, or 4, so up to 4 friends can drive together assuming they're all on different bands. This little car had speeds of about 8 to 10 miles per hour and could travel up to 25 feet away from the remote. Battery would last about 25 to 30 minutes and took about 5 hours to charge. So what's the story behind mines? Back in 2003, when Too Fast Too Furious was in theaters, Nico, a popular RC toy manufacturer, produced Brian O'Connor's legendary Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution in an RC car format. It was a Tuner Lancer Evo that allowed you to customize it just like the RX-8 from EasyTech. My dad introduced us to his hobby RC car from 1989. It was no toy and he built it piece by piece. He showed us the difference between children RC cars and real hobby RC cars. Nonetheless, we were hooked on hobby RC cars, but they were way too expensive for us. My brother went with my dad to Sam's one night and came back with the Nico Lancer. Man, it was the coolest RC car I've ever seen. It was nothing like our toy RC cars. This one was built just like a hobby RC car. It was fast, customizable, and the pistol controller was precise and legit. My brother could literally parallel park that Lancer. Me and my other brother were jealous, and to make matters worse, Sam sold out when we went to get ours. A couple days later, I walked past the RC toy section at Walmart and saw the RX-8. It looked just as legit as the Nico Lancer, but instead of that green Lancer shell, it had a beautiful candy red RX-8 shell, which was my dream car back then. They also had it in a metallic rust 350Z. I bought the RX-8 and my brother bought the 350Z. It was nothing compared to the Lancer though, and that's understandable. No way a company like EasyTech can compare to a company like Nico. Nico has been in the business forever. 
our car and remote was flimsy, unlike the Lancer, controls weren't as precise like the Lancer, and it wasn't even quite as fast as the Lancer, but we still had fun with them. Now that toys are done, let's take a look at some old tech. The Sony DNE710 was an all-in-one CD player. It supported regular CD, MP3 CD, and a bonus, Sony's proprietary music codec 8-Track and 8-Track 3 Plus. Their music codec promised to outperform the popular MP3 codec in terms of compression and quality. Converting your music to 8-Track 3 Plus 48 kilobytes per second allowed you to fit 490 songs on a standard 700 megabyte CDR-RW and is supposedly sound better than MP3 format at 48 kilobytes per second. Some users though have put this theory to the test and have found no difference in terms of quality of sound, causing many to ignore Sony's 8-Track 3 Plus codec. It was a hassle to convert your music to 8-Track using that god-awful Sonic Stage software. I myself used to use 8-Track 3 Plus regularly because I was young and bought into the marketing. But I also remember performing a test of my own, finding no difference in sound quality. But the option was nice. Everything is digital with the CD player. It supported CD text and ID3 tagging, which showed you the name of the song, singer, and album just like the iPod or any MP3 player. The design was very elegant at the time and the player was built for people with an active lifestyle. It also allowed you to connect a Sony headphone with remote control. This allowed you to keep the player in your bag or pocket while you used the remote to change the volume and tracks. The screen was nice and big and supported three lines of text on its dot matrix display. You had three levels of bass, a display option, folder buttons to surf through folders, a jog dial for easy navigation, a hold switch, 14 playback modes, digital volume control, two position volume limiter and G protection settings, heat resistant lid, CDR RW playback, over 95 hours of use on a single set of two AA batteries and A Track 3 Plus playback, 55 hours for CD audio playback, bookmark feature lets you bookmark your favorite songs, sort of like building a playlist, although you would lose it if you change the CDR batteries and it also had a dedicated line-out port and support for a 4.5 volt adapter. The player included the Sonic Stage music software for 8-track conversion and was released in 2003. I don't know when it was discontinued, but they don't make it anymore, so purchasing used is the only way to get one now. Although I doubt you would want one with so much great music players out there. That support higher audio quality codec. So what's the story behind mine? Well, it started with an old Radio Shack CD player, model 426020. I bought it used from a kid at boarding school in 2002 because at the time it was the only way I was going to get a CD player. We didn't exactly leave the campus. Although I got ripped off, I was planning on replacing it one day when I could afford to. My plan was to eventually get the Sony DSJ301, which was my dream CD player. I absolutely love how this thing looked. I used to dream about it, how obsessed I was. But in 2003, when I finally saved up enough money, no retailer sold it. Instead, me and my cousin went out to Target and bought the Sony DE220. He got silver, I got gold. It was a really nice CD player, but I wasn't quite happy with it. I later returned it for the Sony Red Psych DEJ360. The bass on this model was disappointing, so I returned it and went back to the Sony DE220, but went for the blue this time. About a month later, I returned to Target to see if they had anything new in stock. To my surprise, they had a CD player I had never seen before. That player was the Sony DNE710. It was much more expensive than the DE220, but it had MP3 support. This was a great alternative to the iPod. I went back home, packed up the DE220, exchanged it for the DNE710, and I've had it ever since. As a teen, this CD player has by far been my favorite piece of tech that I had owned at the time. I used the hell out of it. Not only did I use it, but my dad used to use it on long distance trip, using the dedicated line out port on the CD player and connecting it to the car's auxiliary port. Battery life was so good that one set of two AA batteries was all we needed. No car power adapter was necessary like other CD players I've owned. This CD player is also by far the best CD player I've ever owned, and it still works 14 years later.
The Sony CD Walkman model DEJ001 was released back in 2005. It wasn't Sony's most attractive CD player. I think that belongs to the Sony DE220 which I recently owned, but eventually swapped it out for the DNE710. The DEJ001 wasn't really all that popular. I think a lot of it had to do with the iPod, MP3 players, and other CD players with MP3 playback. MP3 codec had been around since the early 90s but by the late 90s it started to take off. By 2001 when the iPod was released, MP3 was the way to handle your music library. An MP3 disc is basically a bunch of MP3 files burned on a regular CDR in data mode. The Sony DEJ001 was a traditional CD player with no MP3 support, but back in 2005, CD players from every manufacturer you could think of supported MP3 playback just like the Sony DNE710, which I just covered. Also, some car stereos that came standard with your car were starting to support MP3 playback. MP3 CD players were more expensive than traditional CD players, but the benefits outweighed the price. The Sony DEJ001 came in white, blue, green, and orange. The top of the player is translucent, which makes it kind of cool. There's a very tiny LCD screen placed in the front, which makes it very hard to see if you have the player sitting on your desk. You have the option to turn up or down the bass, set a volume limit, digital volume controls instead of a scroll wheel, and a hold switch to lock the controls. It takes two AA, which is housed inside the player, and gives you about 12 hours of playback. You also have the option to use a 4.5 volts adapter. Other than that, the player is very basic, but it was geared towards teenager, which I was at the time. So what's the story behind mines? I bought it because Walmart marked it down 20 bucks. I bought it in 2008, which is around the same time they discontinued it. In 2008, the world was pretty much dominated by the iPod or iPhone for music playback, but they were expensive, especially for a teenager. CD players had begun to die out, which is why Walmart was clearing out their stock. CDs actually started to die around 2001, when the iPod was first released. Things only got worse from there. So by 2008, any CD player you wanted was dirt cheap. I had no need for the CD player because I had the DNE710, but bought it anyways for the price. I grew up in a world where tech was dominated by Sony, so to see a Sony CD player that cheap was like finding gold. I had not yet learned that Sony was no longer the king of technology. And that concludes this list of old tech and toys. I have some more, so let me know if that's something that interests you. Also, if you found some information a little off, please feel free to share it with us in the comment section below. Also, let us know if you had any of these toys or techs, or what old toys or techs you found recently from your childhood. Give us a thumbs up if you liked the video. If you didn't, thumbs downs work also. Thank you for watching and have a great day.